Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has given a wide-ranging interview to the BBC's Laura Koonsberg. At least it was supposed to be wide-ranging. Koonsberg tackled a range of topics, Russia, the NHS and the economy. Yet, somehow, Sunak managed to avoid saying anything. I guess that's kind of a talent. It came before the publication of the government's new NHS workforce plan. That's their plan in the long term to increase the recruitment of new doctors, nurses and other workers into the struggling health service. But Koonsberg also pressed Sunak on the short term, specifically on waiting lists. That's when this happened. I'm a Prime Minister that wants to make a difference today, and that's why cutting waiting lists is one of my five priorities, and people can already see that difference. Last year, we practically eliminated the number of people waiting two years for treatment. Recently, we've virtually eliminated the number of people waiting one and a half years. If you look at ambulance response times, A&E waiting times, they've improved considerably well, on, from Christmas well, well, on, when, when they were particularly challenging. Can, you, you, but you're right, it's but, also on, we take the long-term point, decisions Minister, for the years into the future. You say that what you're doing on waiting lists is already working. In actual fact the overall number of people waiting is the highest that it has ever been targets on routine waiting lists have been missed targets on cancer care have been missed you can pick some selective statistics but overall the experience that people are having on waiting lists is dreadful in many cases uh, it's because we've had a pandemic, Laura, and the backlog that that ensued was always going to take some time to work through. I was many clear waiting about lists that. were going in the uh, wrong direction well before well, the pandemic. I, I, I've, I've been here for just over six months, and in that time, we've practically eliminated, as I said last year, the number of people waiting two years for treatment. We've just recently practically eliminated the number of people waiting one and a half years. And you've seen an enormous improvement in A&E and ambulance waiting but times. But in January, since, the since overall they were, number since of they were particularly bad. Yes, that's right. And, million, it will take time and for the overall. it will take time for the overall waiting list to come down because as we've recovered from COVID and people have come back, it was always going to take time. But what I can tell you is that because of our record investment today, because of the plans that we've got in place, we are seeing that waiting lists are coming down for individual but people. Rather, and, and, but it, but, and, but and me. Well, hang on, this is really important. And I've always said the overall waiting list was not going to come down until next year. That was always the case. But between now and then, we can start to eliminate the number of people waiting a very long time. But, and then we are making progress on that. But it sounds a little bit like you're wanting us to believe in some kind of parallel universe. So you say again and again, we are cutting waiting lists, except you've just then admitted that the overall waiting list isn't coming down. Isn't it important actually to say, and to admit that overall waiting lists remain an enormous problem and people's experience doesn't match up with you saying repeatedly that waiting lists are coming down because they're not in many cases. Uh, that's literally what I said in January, Laura. When I gave my speech about the five priorities, cutting waiting lists is rightly on there because it is a priority for the country because the waiting lists are too high. People are waiting too long. That's why it's one of my five priorities. And I was very clear then about what our timetable was to improve things. And we're delivering against that timetable. Very confusing stuff. Waiting lists are coming down, even though there are more people waiting for treatment now than there have ever been. And is Sunak even right about cancer treatment? Absolutely not. I'm going to show you some information about cancer treatment targets from Cancer Research UK. April is the last month we have figures for, and the data is about England. The government's first target is that 93% of people should see a specialist within two weeks of a suspected cancer referral by their GP. In April, only 77% of referrals met that target. That's the seventh worst performance on record. The second target is that 75% of patients should have cancer diagnosed or ruled out within 28 days. In April, it was only 71%. In February, that target was actually met, but it was the only time it has been met since its introduction in 2021. The third target is that 85% of people should have received a diagnosis and begun treatment within two months of their urgent referral. In April, only 61% of people were being treated within that time frame. In January, it was a record low, so there's been some improvement, but the target hasn't been met since 2015. The final target is that 96% of people should start treatment within 31 days of doctors deciding a treatment plan. In April, it was just 90%. That's the third worst performance on record. You have to do a lot of squinting to make that look like improvement. The next topic was interest rates, which now stand at 5%, pushing up mortgages and in turn rents. A lot of people are going to find things very difficult in the coming months. 
Was that something Sunak could concede? Do you admit that it will be painful for many, many people? Of course I know that it's a challenging time, and that's why two years ago I started talking about the danger of inflation. And that's why earlier this year, when I set out my five priorities, mm -hmm. what's the first of those? To halve inflation. I'm asking but let's... you a different question, though, Prime Minister. And it might be hard to say to people, but I think people look to their Prime Minister for candour and to tell them hard things. Do you admit that there's going to be a lot of financial pain for many, many people? And is it worth it in order to get inflation down? In inflation, Laura, is the thing that causes people financial pain. Inflation is the enemy. Why? Because inflation eats the pound in your pocket. It makes your paycheck go less far. It eats into your savings. It pushes up prices. It puts at risk jobs and livelihoods. Inflation is the enemy that we need to but conquer. Interest That's rates why. Going up are well, also well, an enemy for many well, people in, in, watching in, this. In, so interest rates, you, interest again, rates are, are a consequence of high inflation. Mm -hmm. And I think we should be very clear about what is doing damage to people, mm -hmm. what is causing people challenges in their day-to-day -day living and their budgeting is inflation. But and and it's inflation that needs too. to be the priority for the government to stamp out. And I'm prepared to do that. And again, that's why it's my number one priority, so people can have some confidence in it. But also, I was one of the first politicians to start talking but about you, the dangers of inflation. That, so you are prepared to see rates continue to rise in order to squeeze inflation. That's what you're saying. But do you admit that that is going to hurt for a lot of people. We're inundated with emails saying their mortgage is going to double. We're inundated with people saying that they can't afford their rent. We're inundated with emails from people, from people saying they're just not going to be able to afford it on top of everything else that's gone up. Now, it might be the right thing to do. You said you're prepared to see it, but do you admit it's going to hurt? So, first of all, with interest rates, yes, they're going up in the UK, and I fully support the Bank of England in their actions. They're also going up in almost all other countries. If you look at interest rates in Australia, in America, in Canada, in New Zealand, all very similar rates to here in the UK. Rates in Europe at the highest they've been for 20 years. So we're not alone in facing this challenge. Central banks across the world are taking very similar but action. But do you think that's but, a comfort for but, people? So, but let me that talk, sounds a bit like you're, you're No, but you're I'm putting it in context. But Well, no, I'm putting it in context. It's important, actually. You talked about me as Prime Minister. Part of my job is to explain to people what is happening with the economy, the context that we're in. It's, it's right for people to know that's the global macroeconomic context. Interest rates in the EU and the US may be high, but they're not struggling with the kind of stubborn, acute inflation that we are. In the US, interest rates are around 5%, but inflation is only at 4.9% and core inflation is at 5.3%. Compare that to our 8.7% rate of inflation and still rising 7.1% core inflation rate. In Europe, inflation also has been coming down. It's currently at 5.7% with core inflation at 5.5%. And their interest rate relevant to mortgage holders is only 4%. So that was Sunak claiming to be giving us the geopolitical context without actually giving us the geopolitical context. After all that evasion, it was only natural for Koonsberg to turn to the questions of Sunak's integrity. A clear verdict was given by the House of Commons that your former boss, Boris Johnson, lied to Parliament. Now, you haven't given a view on whether or not you agree with that verdict. So do you agree with that verdict? You've just said that you want to be honest and you want to show leadership. So do you agree? Yes, I've already said, in fact, that I do fully support and respect not just the work of the committee, who I think did a very thorough job, but also the decision of the House. It's right that That's people... That's not my question. No, no, do but hang on, let me, let me, let me finish, because I think this is important. I do think it's right that people, whatever their position, face responsibility and accountability for their actions. That has happened. And most importantly, Boris Johnson is no longer an MP. Now, you asked me about my view on this, right, and standing up for things, being honest. I was a person that, as Chancellor, resigned from Boris Johnson's government. That is no, you know this better than most because you follow but politics you for a long time. But you didn't want to vote in the Commons. Because, to, to well, I didn't because I was actually speaking and attending an event at a fantastic charity called Jewish Care, which does an extraordinary job looking after people around the country. And you could have gotten country. your prime ministerial but, car and gone back to the House of Commons or, 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 and Or, or, or I could have you fulfilled could have. my commitment to these people who were doing an extraordinary job and support their charity and their fundraising efforts, which I had committed to do. But, but Laura, your point is, do I have to demonstrate my integrity or my leadership? I did that when I resigned. 
I demonstrated that I was prepared to stand up for what I believe in. You know this, as I said, better than most. You've followed politics for a very long time. It is not an easy or common thing for a chancellor to resign from government. I did because I disagreed ago. with Boris Johnson's approach. Did you hear that? I resigned because I disagreed with Boris Johnson's approach. Bruv, you resigned because it emerged that Johnson had knowingly appointed a sex pest to the government. You left only when it became completely untenable to stay without ruining your own reputation. Johnson's approach that you disagreed with so much, you served in his government for three years, two and a half of them as chancellor. Now, that interview was exasperating. It was so exasperating that one of the panellists on the show, writer Ben Elton, reacted like this. Ben, you were looking distinctly unimpressed throughout that interview. Fair to say, I think you've never been a fan of the Conservatives, but what did you think of what Mr Sunak said? Uh, it's not so much depressed as sad. I mean, if anybody was still watching after that extraordinary Orwellian, meaningless, evasive word salad... I mean, I sort of, everybody else wanted to believe and I sort of believe maybe he's kind of a bit more decent, you know, and it turns out he's as much of a mendacious, narcissistic sociopath as his previous boss. I mean, this man literally, he, he, he seems to be making a principle of the fact that he resigned from a government that he'd served loyally and tried to keep propped up for numerous years. He's trying to boast about having worried about inflation while he was Chancellor of the Exchequer under Johnson. Uh, he seems to act as being born into Downing Street six months ago was a, was a miracle birth. No, he was a part of a 13-year cycle, which has got us to this point. He talks about foreign uh, other countries having the same problems. He doesn't admit what he well knows, which is that they're all doing better under them. The evasion, the, the constant repetition of a repaired street. I genuinely wanted to believe mm. that maybe the Tories had made a reset, even though they had elected a man who had loyally served under Johnson, a man who made a mockery of a parliamentary democracy uh, and clearly was, was a, 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 a venally motivated by self-interest. The fact that the Tories chose that easy option, for a man now to say, we don't take easy options, when they took the easy option, which was Johnson, because they thought it would keep them in power, and when they thought for a moment he wouldn't, they dumped him instantly. I mean, uh, he's the Prime Minister. He, he owes us honesty, and we got nothing but mendacity, evasion, and vanity, just dripping with vanity. Aaron, what do you reckon? Does Rishi Sunak strike you as a man of unbearable ego? Well, I don't know him. I mean, he doesn't come across as a narcissist, put it that way. I think he has a grip on reality, which wasn't the case for Liz Truss or Boris Johnson. Is that really saying very much about the content of his character? Not really. But I wouldn't say it's the, the first thing I hear or, you know, see when he's on television or, or, or on the radio. I do get the feeling that if Rishi Sunak had been a Tory politician, even in the mid 2000s, in the 1990s, I think he would have been perfectly fine. He's, you know, perfectly uh, decent, you know, public speaker when he's got, you know, the lines in front of him and the auto cue, less off the cuff. Uh, he's seemingly okay problem solver. His personality is, is pretty good for politics. He can control his impulses in a better way than uh, his, his predecessor, but one most certainly, Boris Johnson. So that's not the first thing that comes to mind. I think really the problem for Sunak is the objective conditions he now faces. You know, he has inherited an absolute shit show economically, socially, but also politically within his own party. You really can't overstate the impact of COVID on the NHS. That's absolutely true. Any politician or political leader of any stripe would be struggling right now to provide the service that people became accustomed to, even in the mid-2010s, let alone what we expect to before that, before austerity, you know, by the late 2000s and, and as recently as 2010, before the general election there. I think that's fair. At the same time, you've got this, this global economic meltdown, um, which happens with COVID, but also I think has been a real problem for Europe in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Britain's, like I say, core inflation is going up. Food inflation is 20%. Uh, but there are other countries really struggling too. You know, Poland, I think, has an inflation rate of about 14%. Lithuania, Latvia, similar. Germany, just slightly below us. Uh, the United States is a different kettle of fish because they're their own energy producer. They have a very different geography to Europe when it comes to energy production and, and food production. They're much less exposed to global trends on this stuff. So that, those are very real problems, which I think any government, any prime minister would have struggled with. Then at the same time, he's got this internal political collapse within his own party, within his own broader coalition, 
partly because, of course, the the, the major thing that got the, uh, the Tory party a majority in 2019 is Brexit and the promises around that, that it would be both transformational but not disruptive. It would be life-changing but also relatively easy and smooth. Clearly, there's a contradiction there, and that's what we're now seeing. And while Brexit isn't to blame for inflation, that's not the reason why we have the inflation that we do, despite what Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, says, it is probably responsible for a couple of percent, most certainly. And we know it's feeding into higher wages in certain industries like HGV drivers, welders, supermarket workers, because of a, a lack of staff in those industries. So it's a, it's a really, really interesting one. I, I think you can have a supremely talented politician right now leading the Conservative Party, and I think regardless, they would be really screwed. So focusing on Sunak as the problem here, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think right now the electorate is much warmer to Sunak than they are to the Conservative Party, but I suspect that won't be enough for them at the next general election. I tend to agree with you. I don't think that Rishi Sunak is a stark raving narcissist in the mold of Boris Johnson or indeed Liz Truss who's you know supersized ego managed to crash the pound he seems like someone who is trying his hardest to come across as likable and tough and underneath it all he's kind of a bit of a scared child going off to school for the first time or something I think he's outperforming the conservatives polling performance but he is, I think, totally wrong. And there is deceit in trying to distance himself from the work of the Johnson administration, of which he was gladly one of the most senior members. Now, Ben Elton's comments on Koonsberg's show have gotten the Tories in a bit of a twist. Tory MP Paul Bristow said this to The Telegraph. Quite why the BBC thinks it's relevant to broadcast to the nation what Ben Elton thinks is beyond me. He is part of the same North London champagne socialist clique that appear periodically to espouse their left wing and anti Brexit credentials to a bored country. They have about as much in common with working people as a £12.50 avocado on toast breakfast. Why is it always avocado on toast? And a second, unnamed Tory detected this plot at the BBC. It's a conscious decision by BBC producers to invite anti-conservative people from the arts world to make personal insults about Tories. It's all packaged up afterwards and then pushed out on social media. Licensed fee payers want to see guests who can provide actual analysis on important issues, not just throw around petty personal jibes. It's not surprising that viewers are switching off. Aaron, these are supposed to be free speech loving Tories. What happened to them? The passion for free speech really vacates the building quicker than Elvis Presley in 1971 as soon as they hear somebody they disagree with. I mean, we found this out the hard way, Ash, by being those people. It really is remarkable. And I think it shows a, how there is you know, a veneer thickness to their sense of political self-esteem and fundamentally a belief in their own political project. And you've seen this with Glastonbury in the last few days. You know, 200,000 people go to Glastonbury. They go to watch Elton John, you know, iconic performer, one of Britain's greatest living artists loved by millions around the world, people are just having a nice time. And yet you've got people like Lee Anderson, the, you know, the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, talking about how it looks like Israel, how it's got Israel-style border security. I, I thought you liked that stuff, but park that for a moment. It's just very, very strange. You know, they really hate people who disagree with them. They really hate it. Uh, and this is something they, they, they claim the left do. You know, the left can't do debate, it can't do dissent, it can't do disagreement. I think there's a little bit to that. I think there's a, there's a part of the, our zeitgeist right now where people can't do that. But the absolute worst people on this are conservatives. They just cannot stomach the idea of people doing, being different to them. And there's something true to the, to the claim that people in the arts are more progressive, more left-wing, probably than the country at large. That's very, I think that's very fair. But clearly that's counterbalanced on the BBC constantly. It's not like Ben Elton is going on BBC Question Time and This Week and the Daily Politics, all these names have changed now, Politics Live rather, all the time. I, I don't think I've seen Ben Elton comment on politics publicly since 2015. I, I might be wrong. And yet you have Nigel Farage on BBC Question Time more than anybody else. You have people like Isabel Oakeshott and Julia Hartley Brewer. They might as well be squatting in BBC studios. So, so this idea that there is a set of pundits on the BBC who are left wing and uh, somehow, you know, they're, they're there far more than they should be. And that the, the, the right and, and social conservatives have been driven out of public debate on the public service broadcast, that it's complete nonsense and fantasy. I mean, watch BBC Question Time every week going back for years. You'll always find a couple of people on the right 
a couple of people on the left, center left, and the, the outrider, the person who will make the zaniest, most crazy arguments, nine times out of 10, it'll be somebody on the right. And, and the other time will probably be Ash Sarkar you know, going the other way. But the modus operandi is the person who's not uh, associated with any party, the person who's not you know, providing the formulaic pedestrian answers as usual, that person's on the right. There's dozens of people who've made a living out of that in this country, Ash. So I find it pathetic and ridiculous. And frankly, I think the people saying these things, they don't believe it. This is a political maneuver. It's a way of silencing the left, and it's a way of creating a cordon sanitaire. You don't go beyond a certain place when it comes to criticizing the right. If you do, you're a Marx person.